and welcome to Stage to Sofa. Today I am joined by a very, very special young conductor who is the 2018 winner of the George Schulte Conducting Awards and has been praised by NBC News as paving the way for conducting. Now he's made international appearances with the LA Philharmonic, the London Philharmonia and the Houston Grand Opera. He is an incredible talent that is going from strength to strength and I'm so excited to have him here today. It is of course the incredible Roderick Cox. So Roderick, thank you for joining me today. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're so, so welcome. How are you coping with this huge, almighty transition that our industry has been faced with? Well, it seems like that's the, that's the popular question uh, these days, right? How are we coping? Um, for me, I, I am doing well. I'm in good health. Um, in terms of my, my spirits, keeping them high and positive, that's something that's, uh, that I have to constantly check in with. Uh, it seems like it's taken me two months to find a sense of, uh, find uh, an equilibrium. Um, I, I'm keeping myself busy and, um, and I think that's important to have a sense of structure because as soon as it happened to find your whole schedule sort of cleared uh, is, is quite shocking for an artist trying to figure out what to practice and what to do. And, and so now I just practice or do things that um, I feel are important or, or fulfill my needs at the moment. Um, so I'm uh, continuing, uh, continuing learning uh, German and strengthening that um, and planning scores for the future but also reflecting on the now and what our industry will possibly look like um, after uh, this this whole pandemic is over and what can my contribution to that to that be yeah, I think it's definitely a time for reflection, like you've said, and, you know, amazing that you finally got into that rhythm now. Two months in, I, I feel you, it's really difficult. It's this whole big thing that we've been faced with that, you know, it takes a while to get into your own groove as such. Now, if I may, Roderick, I would like to take you back a little bit further to your youth. I'm wondering what was your first memory of music and how did that look for you? When was the first time you had that burst of passion for classical music? Well, uh, that burst of passion for classical music actually uh, came quite late when you immediately mentioned the first um, experience with music. I think back at the time when my mom would take me to the church choir rehearsal, she was in the church choir and um, for some for some reason I always really enjoy sitting <laughs> being the kid sitting in the in the in the pews of the church uh, listening to the choir rehearse and I remember the next day when there were choir performance me really sort of rooting for my mom and rooting for the choir uh, and I would really get nervous when they start to sing when my mom would sing, you know, hoping that they, um, uh, there are no errors. I just felt like I was very much a part of the performance and a, a part of uh, the musical experience. So um, when I think about that, I think those are some of my earlier uh, days of, of really being inspired and really feeling like um, uh, some of my wonderful memories, uh, musical memories. And classical music came quite late for me, I, I suppose, because um, growing up in, in the small city of Macon, Georgia, I never necessarily thought of that becoming a classical uh, orchestral conductor on a professional level, level was a, a dream that was truly obtainable. Um, growing up in my world, I, I just enjoyed being in, um, a wonderful music education program at my school where we had band in elementary school, band in middle school, band in high school, and a youth orchestra in the small city of a hundred, a little bit over a hundred thousand in Macon, Georgia. Um, woodwind um, quintet camps at the, at, over the summer at the, at the university and really 
And, you know, growing up in the South, marching band was a big thing. So um, over the summer, getting ready for marching band and traveling with my friends and just, just the joy of being a part of a musical ensemble um, and a bunch of young people working together for a common goal was something that attracted me first before any sort of uh, aspirational goals uh, of being an orchestral conductor. That's so amazing that you were so exposed to so much music at such a young age and so much music in your school as well. It's so incredible. How much impact do you think that had on you becoming the artist that you are now today? I think it had an incredible impact because um, I think it's important for students to be exposed to a variety of things when they're when they're young. It should be we're like little sponges that should be absorbing art, should be absorbing culture, should be absorbing different languages. Um, and music through music, it is a way of connecting us um, not only to ourselves emotionally and getting us giving us a chance to learn about ourselves and self-discipline and how to figure out problems on our, uh, on our own because only we can play the, the French horn before that no one can do it for us. But uh, storytelling through music and um, the connection to different, um, different cultures from around the world. So if you're playing uh, Tchaikovsky and Brahms and some of these composers, it was a way of really understanding those people and, and their lives at, at the time. And so having this sort of imagination as a kid of, of music and imagination for what it's like to be around the world and then to um, come from Macon, Georgia to living in Berlin and walking some of the same streets um, as these composers or um, sitting in some of the great halls of these these conductors or being on those on the same stage and conducting uh, those very same orchestras you've read about or you've heard about um, it, it feels like a, a, a dream come true so it is it is vital that young people have um, the outlet of, of music in in early as early as they can Completely. And I think that leads me very nicely to my next question, which is you are an incredibly busy and inspirational man because you've not only been an incredibly successful young conductor, you've also set up the Roderick Cox Music Initiative in 2018. How you had time to do this, I have no idea, but you did and it's been incredibly successful. I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how that unfolded and at what point did you come up with the idea for this wonderful initiative? Well, let me just start by saying, I was able to do this initiative because I've had um, an incredible amount of help through the connections I made um, in Minneapolis when I was serving there as assistant and associate conductor. Um, I was able to really make friends with um, uh, community leaders and board leaders to help me um, when, fulfill this dream of mine and um, through them, me being in Berlin, able to help raise money for, for this project. The Roderick Cox Music Initiative uh, stemmed out of my own uh, personal story. Um, being from Macon, Georgia, uh, I, I grew up in a, uh, in a single parent household where there wasn't real money for um, uh, private uh, music lessons, nor even purchasing really a uh, an instrument that met my needs at the time as a as an older musician, and when I aspired to go to university and study music, I needed a, a French horn. And um, people might not know, but a French horn. I mean, French horn is actually at that level um, not as expensive as many of the string instruments. But I recall it being about. Uh, two thousand five hundred dollars or three thousand dollars and and that is a lot on um, any household, even with two parents versus one um, and so 
the Otis Redding Foundation, uh, set up by the widow of the famous, uh, um, the late Otis Redding, Zelma Redding, um, she, she wrote a check to get me to purchase a French horn. I had never met her before, never met her before. Um, but somehow she heard about my story and my aspirations and all of a sudden I just remember going to the music store with my soon to be horn professor uh, and playing on a bunch of French horns and feeling like I could choose whichever one um, fit me best. And at that time, when I had that instrument in my hands, it just seemed like the, 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 the sky was the limit. It just seemed like I had the opportunity to, it seemed like it was up to me to determine my own future and my own destiny. Um, and so at, now that I am at a stage in my career where I felt it's important that I try to reach back and help young people who not only have dreams to become a conductor or or play with the New York Philharmonic, but they, they need tools or they need access or they need exposure. And just by a string player having, being able to purchase a new bow to go study at the Interlochen summer uh, camp or being able to uh, have their bridge fixed or just these sort of small necessary things one needs to amplify their studies, um, I thought it was important to provide that. So we set up that scholarship initiative um, last year and uh, raised well over $100,000 in one year. And, and uh, in January, we, um, we gave out about $17,000 of, of scholarships for that first installment, yeah. Wow, that must have been such a moment for you. And have, have you heard from uh, any of the recipients of those scholarship funds and how are they doing? How are they getting on? Well, I actually have a Zoom call tomorrow with um, the students at, at the McPhil um, Academy. It, 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 it's been, and to get an update with them, because I haven't spoken to uh, the students since January and I, I have to say, I'm thinking about, you know, the things I had planned for the summer and the concerts I um, had scheduled, but also those young people, they, they were very much looking forward to uh, studying at Brevard or studying at Interlochen, Interlochen Arts Academy and doing these, um, these summer music activities that are really enriching to a, a student's life. And so uh, tomorrow, I just want to check in and, and uh, see how they're doing, how they're, um, hopefully they can stay motivated um, because I think young people, especially young musicians need that. Um, they're entering into a world that's unsure. They're entering into an, an economy that will be un, unsure. And if they aspire to be classical musicians, I think that's probably the most, <laughs> unsure um, component or element um, that will be coming back. And so how to um, stay inspired, stay determined and continue to, to do the work. So I will, I will have a, a better picture, a better update tomorrow. Oh, that's so amazing and so kind of you to give them that inspiration, which is very much needed at the moment. As you said, it is very uncertain. But the one thing I am clinging on to is that the music is always going to be there. And I think that's very, you know, important to remember. Now, Roderick, you, as I mentioned, are a very, very busy man. And somehow, amidst all of this, you've managed to also create a documentary with PBS and a film North. How did that come about? It's called Conducting Life, and I know it's being released this May. How, how did that unfold? Can you just talk us through that process? Well, the, the bad news is that uh, <laughs> the documentary has been put on hold because uh, it would have been done if coronavirus was pushed back one week. It would have been done. <laughs> oh no, oh that's such a shame. Yes, um, on my, the, the week before my New York Philharmonic debut, 
Um, we had made all the arrangements for me to fly to New York and for us to do the final shoot of the documentary at the New York Philharmonic and to do a final interview and to put a period on the whole thing. Um, but as you know, those concerts were canceled. Then we were thinking about maybe them coming to the Hollywood Bowl this July. I was like, okay, I'm for certain the Hollywood Bowl will happen. This is months away uh, with the LA Philharmonic and that was canceled. And so now we are just thinking about what might be, well, we're actually having to think about how to bring this whole thing to a close. Um, post-corona, how do we do that and not let it linger on? Um, but this documentary started in 2013 by filmmaker uh, uh, Diane Moore at the Aspen Music Festival. And uh, I have to say, at first I was skeptical about it. It, w it, it. it was set up to follow a conductor's life and how does one become a conductor. And I wasn't quite sure of that myself. And so I certainly didn't want cameras following me around. Um, I mean, imagine you're about to go do uh, one of the biggest auditions of your life and um, there's the possibility of failure uh, and someone's offering, wanting to follow you around with cameras. I can't imagine it. Uh, well, I can't imagine it and that's what happened. Um, but somewhat in the middle of the documentary, I started to feel that, wow, this, this work is, is certainly important because uh, it shows young people and it shows uh, aspiring conductors and musicians what actually happens um, in the midst of trying to forge a career or build a career or, or navigate yourself through this, this profession, what actually goes on behind the scenes. Um, and so the documentary has been going for seven years now, and I suppose it will be eight next year, but I kind of feel like it's the, it's like that movie Boyhood, that it, it can only get better with time because my perspective changes and, and you get to see, I don't even know, uh, I haven't seen the footage from 2013, but I, I would be very, very interested to, I keep saying, let's do another interview because I don't know what I said back then and we need to make sure um, you have the most up-to-date perspective. That is so incredible and to think that's what seven years of your life that's just been documented that's so incredible you know for future generations to be able to explore and embrace it's amazing so wow I'm really going to be looking forward to when it can fingers crossed be finished because it sounds like it's been a very long process but a very rewarding and interesting one as well so I'll look forward to that coming out now Roderick I wonder if I can perhaps ask and take you back to your favorite performance do you have a favorite performance that if you could go back in a time machine too you would go to oh I think I would go to my performance with the Minnesota Orchestra Tchaikovsky Symphony Number no. 4 for some reason, I, I look back at that because it was my subscription debut um, with that orchestra, with the major orchestra. And it's very interesting because I remember quite uh, vividly how nervous and afraid I was. It just felt like everything was on the line for that audit, for that um, for for that concert and there was just so much pressure on my back um but it was an incredible all it was also an incredible opportunity and when i look back on musical examples of that um performance for some reason i i it looked even though it might not felt have felt that way during the performance it looked like I was so free and it looked like I was so, um, I had such a strong belief um, and um, conviction um, in the music. Uh, and I think when you are able to experience those types of uh, successes, you really try to work hard to 
get back there, uh, you try to work hard to figure out what was the, the routine or the scenario to get me back there. And um, with the conductor, obviously this is always, this is a tough thing because it's, it's always different because um, there are different variables. I mean, as a singer, this is your voice. You should know how it's, I mean, if, it, if it's in your control, you should know how it's going to sound at 8 o'clock uh, p.m. As Leotine Price said, she, uh, she knew exactly how she would sound at 8, 8 p.m. by the, just the preparation she did and um, how she took care of vo her voice. But uh, with, as a conductor, you don't know. Each orchestra is different and uh, each, each scenario is different. And, um, and so therefore, it, you can be very much prepared for a concert or a piece, but it, it, it involves a collective, and, and um, which is the beauty of it, the beauty of us all working together to reach that common goal. Um, but yes, there are a couple of those perform performances where it feels like you hit this wonderful wave or roller coaster that is like, yes, this is what it's all about. This is addictive and I wish I can go back there and enjoy it versus being uh, so nervous about it. I, don't you wish you could just like, oh, I wish I could have enjoyed that moment more. Yeah, it is funny, isn't it? When you look back in hindsight, it's just, it's so, you always can't believe what you've done. And I think that's such a fantastic example of that. So thank you for sharing it. Corona, I feel like I wish I could go back to all my performances. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Oh my goodness. Now, I know you debuted at Houston Grand Opera. How did you find the process of conducting an opera versus a symphony? How did that, how did you work that process out? Well, I, I was so pleased that I, my opera debut was in Houston. It is an, an amazing company and the staff there, Patrick Summers, they were all so supportive and um, really, uh, I just really thank them for giving me that opportunity. Um, with an opera, it, there are just so many more moving parts uh, and there are so many, <laughs> I mean, you have people very far away and, and how people are feeling this day or that day or the singer might need this or that. And, and um, that was an incredible learning experience. And the thing about working, doing opera is sometimes it's incredibly slow. Um, and you're thinking, what am I doing here? Why am I here? What's, what's happening now? Uh, and then there are moments where when it's all coming together, it's just absolutely uh, exhilarating. And so as a, as a conductor in an opera, you. I think you really feel like a true collaborator and you're working with the, the director on trying to understand the, the role of the characters uh, in the opera with the singers and us discussing those. Uh, and not one person's answer is the one, but, um, um, and then that informs how you, how you conduct the the piece and so i come to the opera with my ideas in mind of this character this is what i think this is how this should go um but then to listen to your colleagues and uh, hear how what they think or what they think of this musical line or this musical phrase uh, uh it's a humbling experience and it's a it's a true collaboration yeah i agree it really is a team effort isn't it lots of different people from all different parts of you know backstage and on stage and the orchestra it all comes together and it is a beautiful moment when it all like you said melds together and we get the beautiful art form now in terms of moving forward past these challenging times how do you see the opera art form moving forwards as a whole the other side of this hmm well i think that well that's a very tough question because the opera, the art form, you're talking about opera as a whole, um, that, that I don't know. But what I would hope is that 
um, our industry has given a great deal of thought of how truly vulnerable it is and the work it must really do to be inclusive and bring many more people inside of it and to open up the curtain so that people know that what we're doing and the contribution to the community is invaluable. We just can't continue uh, the same old, same old. And there are artists that, you know, feel that, okay, can we get back to, can we get back to business? Can we get back to doing things the way we used to do it? And I don't think that recipe or that ingredient um, will work in the future. And so how do we hear more diverse voices uh, on the opera stage and, and, and give opportunities for, for younger singers and support uh, their, their careers? How do we, how do we use technology and, and media and whatnot to really connect us? And I think we're going to see in the future, hopefully, um, more, more of this work being done. It seems like uh, during coronavirus, all the, all the artists and musicians are becoming uh, professional journalists <laughs> uh, with, with their, their blogs and conversations and whatnot to stay connected. We should continue to do that uh, in, in the future and not just hide behind the music, but who are the people behind the music and, um, and shed light into our organizations, yes. Yeah, and I think definitely it's time for change and hopefully that will be a positive outcome from this whole situation we found ourselves in. Uh, Roderick, you've been such a joy to speak to, but I have come to my final question now. I could keep speaking to you for an hour, honestly, you're fantastic. But I have got my final question, which is, what piece of advice would you give to an 18-year-old Roderick? Oh, that's, oh man. <laughs> hmm. I, you know, 18-year-old Roderick, I think, did pretty work with well, I think one thing 18-year-old Roderick did that I truly admire was the fact that he was persistent and, and never took no for an answer when someone told him he couldn't do something. Uh, and so that's great. Um, I think for him to, to be easier on himself and not beat himself up, but to continue to, to, to search for answers and explore the world a bit sooner, to get out of the comfort zone and, and, um, and, and go to Europe and, and make connections and study conducting there and study the languages um, to just sort of uh, consume more and listen to more music sooner. But um, I'm proud, I think I'm proud of 18 year old Roderick to get, <laughs> for him getting me here. But um, I remember there was some pretty down or sad moments for 18 year old Roderick, but I don't know if I would take them away because perhaps they've helped make uh, me who I am a stronger individual and, um, and a more durable uh, person. That is such a beautiful answer and you're the first guest that's actually given yourself some absolute warranted praise and kindness. So thank you for joining me on Stage to Sofa, Roderick. You've been such a fantastic joy to speak to. Thank you, Phoebe. Thanks. And take care.